Okay, so um, with that, I would like to move to the next uh, short talk. Paolo, bye bye, and have a good trip to your uh, hospital in Batangas. Okay, so at this point, I would like to um, uh, share with you some of the um, initiatives of PASA to help stem COVID-19. And uh, it's really also to acknowledge the persons who help us in our efforts. So I would like to share my screen. Please bear with me for a short while. And um, okay. Do you see my screen now? No. No, ma'am. Just a while. Just a while. Okay, so um, I just like to start off by, um, well, affirming. I think most of us uh, will join me in saying that uh, we have some strengths in PASE, and that uh, would be our great openness and dynamism of exchanges within PASE. And then uh, while we have divergent opinions uh, and views, scientific views for s some matters, we um, show mutual respect to one another. Uh, we do have a broad range of expertise with lots of young blood. And um, we are composed of multi-universities, therefore also uh, multi-perspectives. So we have public and private universities. And then we are, some of our members are in MAST, in government, and are linked with government in the private sector. Most of all- and Giselle, you may want to put it in presentation mode. The slides. So, I mean, what is it is in presentation mode as uh, ah, okay. Time. Okay. No, it's we're we're time. yeah. On our end, it's fifty percent. Well, ooh, so right, I don't uh, know why. Uh, okay. It's uh you are screen sharing, and it's the I, I put in my full PowerPoint. So um anyway, so I thought that you would be able to read this well. But anyway, I think uh, I wanted to uh, just uh, well then read out most of it or uh, explain uh, what's in the slides. So uh, we welcome discourses with and acknowledge contributions of non passe colleagues who shared s and vision. And we did this a lot during COVID-19 where we invited non passe members into our Google group discussions. So PASE espouses inclusivity. So, well, like everyone else um, in the world, we panicked. We um, were worried about uh, COVID-19 at the onset, and we tried to move fast. So uh, we uh, assessed developments, continued reading articles, scientific preprints, and publications. We gave webinars. It's ongoing. We're now on uh, webinar number 17 or 18. We expressed our opinions, took positions, offered advice, and took actions. And we tried best to base it on scientific evidence. So the first thing we did was to come up with a statement on COVID. And the persons um, who helped us formulate this statement are Rodelia Subade, Edna Cobb, and myself. And uh, we focused on three areas. Uh, of uh, interventions for COVID-19 would be containment and mitigation, immediate, short to medium term, medium to long term interventions, advice, then triage and treatment, and mass testing and fast tracking. And these three general themes uh, were, were uh, substantiated with 17 passive bulletins on these three topics. And we shared with Secretary Pernia 
our advice, our proposals, so that he could share them as needed with government, particularly the IATF. Okay. So um, let me now tell you a bit about the early days of COVID. We formed a group, and I did not invite uh, the members of this core group. Vic Ilag, Larry Ilag, Homer Pantua, Al Saratika, Pia Bagamasbad, and Chris Monterola, they we naturally came together because they were responsive to uh, our call. So by March 19, we had a letter addressed to Secretary Duque, okay, which I um, uh, delivered, and um, it addressed the need for testing. And because in this group, we had Homer, we had Pia, we had Vic, uh, we knew that um, we had the capability to come up with a, an RT-PCR kit that was on par with the WH uh, RT-PCR reference kit. And we could produce it uh, by ordering in bulk the components of the kit. But we knew also that um, the UPNIH RT-PCR kit was on its way. And so we were also in constant communication with um, Raul Destura. And um, well, we offered to provide the RNA extraction kit, uh, which was missing in, in this kit, or would be uh, maybe insufficient in quantity, as well as in other foreign um, kits that were imported. Okay? And we could provide it at a lower cost because we would order in bulk. Also, we were made aware that um, the Philippine Genome Center was ready uh, to be certified for uh, as a testing center by the DOH and the RITM. So uh, we made representations with uh, Secretary Duque and others to get the PGC on its track for certification because at that time it was only the UP uh, NIH that was certified aside from the RITM. As wonderful as that, there were 100 volunteers. They were MDB practitioners from uh, UP Diliman and UP Los Baños. Uh, who were gathered together by Ray Garcia of uh, UP Miliman and IMDB. And so uh, together with the training and uh, the advocacy for getting more training and testing centers supported by the DOH, together with Cynthia Saloma, Ray Garcia, Pia Bagamasbad, uh, Des Hautea, and Sean Raimudo, who worked on the uh, UP Los Baños testing center, we are able to get uh, them certified. And um, now we have 67 licensed RT-PCR laboratories all over the country. And um, early on also, we had John De Castro, Salvador Cawili, and National Scientist Julie Cruz presenting to us their plan for sample pooling for diagnostics in low resource carriers. And in fact, we were able to present this sample pooling strategy to uh, Paolo and the Ayala Health Group. So um, let me now move to um, another initiative that we had, which al already des described, and that was to uh, champion CEPID, and you already talked about it. But I think, you know, we have to recognize al um, initiative because through uh, the Philippine Science for Progress, Philippine um, uh, Business for Progress, we were actually able to get information on those uh, DOH TB DOTS centers with uh, gene expert machines. And we were able to get information on contact persons. And PASI members were ready to help train or train or learn from uh, the personnel in those uh, TB DOTS. So we were offering ourselves a support group. And also, when uh, we were trying to get the safety kits imported to the country. We were in constant uh, communication with Secretary Purnia, Secretary Duque, and Secretary Purnia to uh, Secretary Lotsin. And just to um, complete the, the circle, we wrote the U.S. Ambassador, the Philippine Ambassador to the United States in Washington, D.C., through our colleagues, our uh, UP alumni in San Francisco, through the San Francisco Consulate. So we actually, uh, well, uh, completed a circle 
And we were very happy when we learned about the first shipment of second. Now we know that uh, it's not coming in as um, much, as many as we expected because of the demand in the United States, but there are 22 licensed gene expert labs in the country. And uh, I think that's quite impressive. So here you have uh, the number of tests uh, done by um, the DOH count. And I think that that's something that um, will increase in the, the, the weeks to come. Thank you, Sahel. Uh, could me, could sorry, you click know. on the slideshow? Slideshow to, to, to magnify. Okay, just a while. Do you see it now? You yes. said I think maybe oh. it's it's um it's uh, on the full screen. <clears throat> okay, just a moment. I will um just uh, expand this thing if it does not um show. So is this what you see? It's it's too big. Yeah. Well, because when I uh, click the, the slideshow, it has been on the slideshow, but, you know, uh, looks like still does not work. Is that That's okay? okay. That's better. That's better. Okay. I'm so sorry about that. But I had clicked on the slideshow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, right. Okay. So anyway, uh, this... Uh, Edsel, I think you can just go to view op options. Okay. Yeah. So... Um, well, this is the third slide, and I just wanted to tell you that there are the, these are the titles of the uh, bulletins that were um, prepared, and each of them has its own author. So I'm saying that um, this is not, you know, fully passed and or, or endorsed by everyone in PASA. Each one of these bulletins has its own authors and the scientific references, which we required for each bulletin. And I don't have the uh, authors here, but these are all available in our website, okay? And some of them are co-authored with non pasa members. So um, containment and mitigation and water, Francis de los Reyes, back to economic normality, Noel uh, Miranda, nutrition to fight COVID, Vic uh, Elad, avoid economic harm, that's Noel again, hand hygiene, that's Joey Florencio, triage and treatment, drugs to treat COVID, Vic Vic Ilag, TB vaccine. This is, uh, I think, uh, Vic Ilag and uh, maybe Larry Ilag. Need for a low cost ventilator. It's uh, multi offered. It's uh, led by Gobet Adinkula. This uh, Pase, Pasuk, uh, San Agustin dashboard, co authored by uh, me and uh, Rodel Subade and uh, John De Castro and Tirsa Rampilio, president of the Philippine Association of State Universities and Colleges. Uh, COVID pilot testing center, the Mario, Santo Domingo, Sean Raimundo, Desert Otea. Sample pooling, this is by um, um, John De Castro, Badong Kawili, and others, Duli Cruz. DOH dots testing centers for COVID. This is us with Alsa Rapica, our core group, rapid antibody test. Here now, when uh, this started coming in, we came up with a um, uh, a possibility in with Gani Padolina, and then we have this again from uh, COVID testing uh, center to pooling uh, with John De Castro mass testing. That's our core group again, increasing RT PCR. This is us, our core group, and finally we came up with a um, a bullet bulletin on an analytical validation test of lateral flow or rapid antibody kits, reference to um, Eliza reference to RT-PCR. So um, then we also had this um, education uh, capacity building and training materials and we posted on our website seminars of uh, UP System, UP uh, uh, Manila, as well as those from De La Salle. And we had this in the Philippine Science Letters. And uh, then of course we have our webinars that are ongoing, hosted by former president, uh, Kathleen K. Aguizo. So in the latter days, so when there was lots of talk on ease of lockdown towards economic recovery, 
Uh, there was a call from Secretary Pernia for PASA members to come up with proposals on uh, how to get the economy back, okay, through ease of lockdown. And we have young faculty of the UP uh, School of Economics who were writing articles, okay, and publishing them. We have Marjorie uh, Paharon and Sarah Dawai Bukanes and others. Then um, we brainstormed in our group, and by this time, we had Gani Padolina of Pascal Pharma as an important member of our group, and we listened uh, to uh, Ed Salsalvania and uh, Tony Dans uh, of the NAST, and um, then we tried to give advice to uh, the private sector because they needed this kind of advice, even if they had their own plans. So uh, we actually came up with a bulletin which indicated that for return to work, we would recommend only the essential on the ground workforce. And then we wanted the robust, healthy ones uh, who would be about 20 to 50 years old. In case they got infected, they would have a better chance of uh, fighting COVID. Then uh, it, it is uh, implied that they would have no COVID-19 contact, no comorbidities like uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, no high-risk conditions, and that they're asymptomatic, and then they would undergo tests and it would be negative. And then in the workplace, they would practice physical and social distancing of about six feet or two meters. And in the workplace, there would be a staggered low density work schedule and seating in the workplace and in the vehicle. So it came hand in hand with um, the, um, well, the transport, the, uh, the transportation of the employees. So at this point, let me tell you that there is a special person who um, connected us to the Ayala Health Group. First, Gani Padolina of Pascal Pharma, linked with Rizi Alejandro of Ayala Health. And then uh, my uh, dear friend from uh, grade school to high school, her name is Luli Eras de Leon. She is a immediate past president of the Ayala uh, Foundation, Incorporated. She linked me up with Paula Barone. So thank you, Luli, Gani, Rizi. And um, aside from Ayala Health, I had great opportunity to give Luli, who's now in private sector, some advice uh, for her own company. Okay. So anyway, let me just tell you about the testing. Uh, that's also contained in our bulletin. So, and this is also based on the advice of our MDs. So we would recommend a 14-day clinical symptoms test and then um, antibody and RT-PCR test kits using ones with high performance specifications. And we wanted to assert that we would have to know the performance specifications and they would have to be very, very good. We would uh, then, um, well, under certain circumstances, promote or do a good sample pooling with a good design, but that would mean that there would be a good sampling method. Then we uh, recommended periodic multi-time point testing. Of course, that's a bigger investment, but it is worth it. Would be administered by health workers and there would be quarantine of positives, not just stay home, quarantine of positives, okay? So the people who helped us here, Gani Padolina, Vicky Lag, Homer Pintua, Noel Miranda, Joyce Ibana, Annika Padolina, Delisa Maligale, and Ernie L. Barrios. Cool. So now I'd like to say that um, Gani Padolina in Pascal Pharma has implemented what we had recommended for his own company. And uh, by this time, there was a very um, high performance uh, kit that was made available in the country. And it had a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 99.8%. So that if you had 1,000 people and assumed 1% incidence, that would mean that 10 have COVID, 990 have no COVID. And at 100% sensitivity, that would mean 10 are two positives, zero are false negatives. And uh, at a 99.8% specificity, you'd have 
998 that are true negatives and two that are false positives. And we know what the implications of false positives are and false negatives are. And so if you decrease the sensitivity and the specificity by a bit or a lot, then these numbers will change. Okay. So the way Ghani understand implements it in Pascal Pharma is they do the 14-day test for work clearance. They are using the Alexis uh, Roche uh, test and they do it twice in 14 days or weekly. And the positives are quarantined and then they take the RT-PCR test. So this is something that we thought would be like best effort, but then you know how the science changes over time. And that is, I think, what the role of the PASA is ultimately. It's to alert the government, the business sector, ourselves, academe, on latest uh, published literature. And uh, well, we take it from there because there's just so many unknowns in this time of COVID. Okay? So aside from Ayala Health, the ones who had sought our advice is the Go Negosha group. And recently, I um, was asked to be a panelist in a Balik Kabuhayan uh, webinar. But before I go to that part, let me just say that more recently, we came up with another initiative and this is because we wanted to thank our uh, frontliners at the UPPGH. And so I posted a photo of Dr. Joey La Pena in his complete PPE together with his team. And it elicited a lot of response from our PASA members wanting to help on the ground. And so we decided that we would come up with a PPE campaign but not to PGH because PGH was receiving a lot of PPE donations already. Same with San Lazaro Hospital and the private hospitals. So in particular, we decided that we would make underserved COVID-19 hospitals and other facilities in the country as our beneficiaries. Of course, it is a lot more challenging, but we wanted to, um, well, I have, excuse me, to get three more people into the, uh, you know, to the conference, okay? So anyway, so back to this. So uh, we embarked on this. And uh, so together with past president, Pierso Ronquillo and, um, and Al Sarafica, we conceptualized it together with John de Castro and Nelo Aguila of University of San Agustin Center of Bioinformatics. So, John is a Balik scientist uh, of the DOST and he's serving U San Agustin in Iloilo. And so John came up with a dashboard based on how we plan to do this. And so the dashboard is available at the PASA website, <coughs> the PASA website and the UCS website. And since then, We've had many requests from these underserved hospitals through their key informants who were identified by state universities and colleges near them. So the role of SOOCs in this initiative is central. So let me now recognize our private partners who've helped us Side from, side from PASE, and CFI of San Agustin, and the SUCs, we have donors. We have a huge donor, Care of Pierce Ronquillo, who donated tens of thousands of units. <coughs> okay. That, cons that uh, constitute the PPE. We have the Federation of Filipino Chinese uh, commerce, uh, commerce and industry as a major donor and the Rotary Club of Makati as major donor. And then um, when we got all of these donations, Pierce and I, we put them in boxes. We had to allocate them properly. And um, it was no longer based on the needs of 
the uh, the requested uh, uh, numbers of hospitals. The DOH, the Office of Civil Defense, met with us and they advised us also to verify these numbers and to also consider the number of healthcare workers and hospital beds in these hospitals. Okay. So uh, once these boxes are already ready for shipment, oh, we thought, oh, it'd be easy to ship them out. We had them in uh, two storage places. And then we realized, hey, it's going to cost us. It's going to cost us to send this. So the first six boxes I was in charge of, they are to Sultan Kudara, to um, Katbalogan, Cotabato City, to uh, Bontok, and to, to Gegarao, and one to Haro. And when I went to Airspeed to check uh, the price of this uh, shipment, it cost uh, 31000 Okay, 31000 And so with the help of our uh, Paso Vanguard, Father Ben Nebres, through the Ateneo Donation Group, we are able to get a 15% air discount from Airspeed. Air speed. Okay, so I'd like to thank our Paso Vanguards for helping us. So Rotary Club of Makati is through Paso Vanguard uh, former president Fred Pasquale. So we'd like to thank everyone who contributed to this effort. And now the first six boxes are on their way to these underserved hospitals. So I'd just like to um, end by um, telling you that um, we um, were invited, we were invited um, to um, participate in this Balik Tabukayan. So I think this is in line with the Sec Ernie's uh, call uh, to uh, economic recovery. And the, um, the, the viewers there were from MSMEs, co-ops, LGUs, okay? And um, in that um, forum were um, Joey Concepcion, Congressman Joey Salceda, Congresswoman uh, Jeanette Galin, myself, Dr. Raymond Law uh, of uh, Philippine Children's Medical Center, and then Josephine Gotianumia from the private sector, and Dr. Nikita Padilla as a uh, moderator. And we were hosted, we were moderating, Karen Dabley was there. So here you'll just see uh, uh, the other recommendations that we made, I made, and I'd like to um, point out protection, hygiene, nutrition, immune testing, boosting, immune boosting, prophylaxis, and treatment, because I already uh, told you about return to work and mass transport and testing. And so here we have signages, flyers, you know, uh, some companies in um, foreign countries, they put the signages on the floor so that uh, people who walk you know, from room to room, we'll remember uh, the reminders. Okay, signages on the floor, flyers, seminars, constant reminders, and best practices. We already know mask uh, protection. There is this um, suggestion to um, consider betadine, povidone, salt saline gargles. Okay, they're relatively cheap. Then, of course, good ventilation, dry, clean air exchange. Uh, the WHO reminds us to avoid the three C's, the crowded, close contact, and confined spaces. Then we are reminded uh, to uh, eat a healthy, balanced green and fish diet. And there's this uh, bulletin by the ELUG on what's the value of fish oil diet, of a fish oil diet. And I think it's related to the VCO diet as well. Okay, Vitamins, minerals, food supplements, and food supplements. Now I'd like to uh, focus on this BCG TB vaccine. And I think that uh, at this point, we, we cannot say that, uh, you know, we will just ignore this because recently there was an important paper in the published in the US proceedings of the National Academies of Science that says that there seems to be a significant difference in uh, populations that had received a BCG vaccination versus those who had not in their response to COVID-19. So I say this is still an open question. And the uh, vaccine trials, BTC, 
BCG vaccine trials in Australia uh, will be ending in a month or so. Finally, uh, on the treatment, hydroxychloroquine, zinc, azithromycin, steroids, Avigan, remdesivir. I think now it's only remdesivir that's uh, being considered for treatment. But then recently again, there was a major paper. I think it's a um, substantive paper that's telling us that hydroxychloroquine treated cases, uh, well, showed good, good results. Okay, so anyway, I think we should keep an open mind about these uh, interventions as scientists. Okay, the rest are um, things that are already covered by uh, the, um, the rest of our uh, uh, panel discussions. And um, therefore, I would not uh, wish to uh, repeat them. I just wanted to say that uh, holistically or uh, maybe psychologically, uh, we should think of a, a change in the goals, attitudes, and mindset. And we could actually consider the MSMEs as transformative agents in society. If uh, the, um, the management would impose these things or would make sure that these uh, precautions are taken in the company, then perhaps the employees could then bring this all the way to their homes, to their families. So psychological and physical health and welfare, I think it's time to simplify our lifestyle and aspirations. Then we should uh, think of efficient, sufficient productivity to earn a living and provide healthy quality goods and services to society. Okay, so we have to rethink the products and services that we would prioritize during this time of COVID and make sure that they are good, not only for ourselves, but also uh, for the rest of society and also for the environment. So I think it's time to think also of the circular economy. Okay, so I'd like to end with this. This is from Anthony Fauci, okay, from, from uh, the NIAID of the US National Institute of Health. The more things we can all do to mitigate our risk of exposure, the better off we are all, in my opinion. Not only does it flatten the curve and allow health care providers to maintain levels of service that aren't immediately and catastrophically overwhelmed, it also reduces unnecessary suffering and deaths. And I think this is important, buys time for the scientific community to study the virus in order to come to a more full understanding of the breadth of its impacts in both the short and long term. I do not think there is a shortcut in the way, there's not, no shortcut in our understanding uh, the virus in its totality. So let us be patient and let us resolve to um, work with one another to try to overcome the challenges, the difficulties that this pandemic has brought upon us. I like to end with um, this uh, photo of Elon Musk, case okay, Starlink over the heavens, and it's actually confounding astronomy, the studies in astronomy, but I think it um, gives us like a glimmer of hope on how science and technology might be able to uh, the way for a better life for all of us in the future. For one, this would help in the connectivity amongst all of us. So thank you very much for uh, listening uh, to my talk.